to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the gospel is god's power to save romans chapter 1 verse number 16. we welcome you today to our study of the book of romans in this series we're going to be looking at the book of romans and and the main message that paul is trying to establish about god's power to save now being in the gospel of christ we welcome you today to our study as always we want to encourage you to locate your bible and have it handy as we're going to be searching the scriptures together on this wonderful study in the book of romans today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the churches of christ the church of christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly either on sunday or wednesday night if you've got a Bible question or you'd like to know more about the, the church or, or worship or how to have a relationship with God, they'd be more than happy to sit down and discuss the Scriptures with you. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of God's Word. You can access all our free material from our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of good Bible study materials, whether it be video or audio or written transcripts, all of them are free of charge and we'd love for you to access those. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's study on the book of Romans or any of our studies, we've got Bible studies on every book in the Old Testament and New Testament and a host of good topical studies as well. You can access those from our website thegospelofchrist.com. Just click on our media request and we'll be happy to send those to you free of charge. As Paul discusses the book of Romans, as he writes this letter to Christians in the area of Rome, Paul is dealing with some very a very specific audience with a very specific theme. Some of these people have come out of Judaism. Some of them maybe are still entrenched in some of its ideas. And Paul is writing to show that it's no longer the Jewish system. It's no longer the Levitical way. Now it is the gospel of Christ that saves all men. Key verse to the whole book is likely Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. I want you to notice these words with me in Romans 1, verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. As Paul thinks about the wonderful idea of the gospel message and, and salvation. He wants these, these people, his readers, to clearly understand that it's not Christ plus something else. It's not the old Jewish Levitical sacrificial system. The gospel is God's power to save. Everybody is justified under the same system, both Jew and Gentile, under the same system by faith in Jesus Christ today. When we think about this idea, the gospel is a very unique word in the original language. Literally it means good news or glad tidings. Something that if you heard it, it would be wonderful to hear about. Well, what is the gospel? That God sent His Son. John 3 verse 16. That He loved the world so much that He gave His Son to die as a once for all sacrifice. Hebrews 10 verse 12, so that whoever wanted to could obey the gospel and become a Christian and live with God in heaven. Now friend, if that isn't good news, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, that's where the power of salvation is today. And so the, the power of God is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, Hebrews 4 verse 12 teaches us 
the Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. That, that, that message contained in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's living, breathing Word, that's where salvation, that's where we learn about God's salvation today. This is why James would say in James 1 verse 21 that we're to receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save our souls. We're born again by the Word of God which lives and abides forever. 1 Peter 1 verses 23 through 25. And when Peter went in and spoke the gospel to Cornelius, he had to hear words whereby he could be saved. Friend, the, the message of the gospel contained in, in human and preached in human uh, language today, although uh, preached centuries back, that power is still just as important for men and women today. And so when you think about the book of Romans, please understand the overarching theme is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's God's power to save today. If men and women are going to be saved, It'll only be by Jesus. That's why Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Now, in this study today, we're going to be examining the first four chapters of the book of Romans. And, and they break down in a very unique way. Chapters 1 through 3 all are identified as being under sin. And the writer begins this way. The Holy Spirit portrays the, the idea this way to show the need for the gospel. If all are under sin in chapters 1 through 3, then everybody needs the gospel. And then in chapter 4, the power of faith in that gospel is so clearly revealed. Chapter 1, the Gentiles are mentioned as being under sin. We now have the Jews who are standing in the background cheering on God for condemning the Gentiles. And yet then you open to chapter 2 and the writer will identify the Jews are also under sin. As an introductory matter in chapter 1, let's also realize from the outset of this book that faith is one of those key words and our understanding of that word in the book of Romans and in the Bible is pivotal to understanding God's message of salvation. There's been so much confusion and, and controversy about faith, but faith is not hard to understand. Faith is obedient trust based on the evidence of Almighty God. Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is substance of those things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. There's substance, there's evidence, and we can see that in creation and in the Word of God. But when we talk about faith, we're also talking about obedience. A lot of times people want to separate faith from obedience. But here's what's amazing. At the beginning of the book of Romans, and at the end of it, it's the obedience of faith that Paul is talking about in this book. Let me show you. Look in Romans chapter 1, verse number 5 with me. In, at the beginning, in Romans 1, 5, Paul says, Through Him, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for, notice this, the obedience of faith or to the faith among all nations for His name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now flip over to the very end of the book. And notice in Romans 16, 26, Paul also uses this same definition of faith. The Word of God says, But now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience of or to the faith. Friend, when we think about the book of Romans and we think about faith at the beginning and at the end and everything in between, kind of as a bookmark on both sides, we have faith and the obedience of faith. Faith is, this is where Martin Luther got so confused as he uh, thought about faith and Romans teaching, what he thought Romans taught on faith and, and James on faith. Well, friend, it's not as though there are two different ideas. It is the obedience of faith that is pleasing to Almighty God. And understanding that in the book of Romans is so important. Now, how do we get that faith? Well, friend, faith is based on the evidence, and you can see the evidence of God in creation. I want you to look in Romans chapter 1, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says about there being evidence 
for your faith. Romans 1, notice what the Word of God says in verse number 20. For since the creation of the world, His, that is God's invisible attributes, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Men and women, why are they without excuse today? Because very simply, God has given evidence. You can look around at His creation and know there is a God. And so chapter 1, Paul will go on to identify the sins of the Gentiles with the specific purpose of helping them to see they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then we turn to chapter 2, and now Paul identifies that the Jews who are in the background cheering on God as he identifies the sins of these pagans, Paul now turns to the Jews and says, You Jews also are under sin and need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, why were the Jews under sin? Well, friend, their playing religion wasn't what it was all about. Notice Romans chapter 2, verse number 1. Paul says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. Notice this. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Paul now turns to these, these Jewish Christians or Jewish people and he says, and, and you, you're without excuse also. You go around condemning all these other people and yet you practice some of the same things. You know, it sounds a lot like what Jesus said to the Jewish leaders of his day. You go halfway around the world to make a proselyte and you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. You say and do not do, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 23. And so when we think about Romans chapter 2, we think about the Jews also are under sin and need the gospel. And friend, we need to realize that, that God's wrath is going to be unleashed on those who are not in Christ and who have not obeyed the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 2 and notice again what he's going to say to these readers in Romans chapter 2 verses 3 and 4. Paul says, and do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? These Jewish people who thought they were the religious elite, who thought just because they were heirs and descendants of Abraham, they were naturally going to be a, a, the best religious people everywhere, they need to realize, don't think that you're not also under condemnation. You've done some of these things. You've practiced some of these things. You've participated in sin as well. And God's wrath, unless you obey the gospel, just like with the Gentiles, so it is with the Jews, unless you obey the gospel, you're also going to be lost. You see, the Jews of Jesus' day and of the first century had a better than everybody else mentality. Because they were the descendants of Abraham, because they had received the Ten Commandments, because they had been that chosen nation in times past, they naturally thought they were the upper echelon of the religious elite and God's promises naturally were going to go to them. And Paul here says very clearly, you're under sin also. You desperately, you desperately need the gospel also just like the Gentiles. Don't be hypocritical. Instead, turn to the gospel and look for salvation. In fact, did you know this? Who's a real Jew anyway? That's the next question we want to address. The, Jew, the Jews, they think, well, we're God's chosen people. Well, who is a Jew? Paul's not going to make any friends with the Jews in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, when he identifies who the real people of God are. Notice these words, Romans 2, verse 28 and 29. The writer says, for he is not a Jew, watch this, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew 
who is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Paul clearly says, just because you've got some genealogical records you could turn to to say that you have the same DNA with some of these uh, great leaders in Israel, that doesn't at all make you a Jew. It's not what's outward that makes you the chosen people of God. It's what's inward. It's not circumcision of the flesh. It's circumcision of the heart, changing your life and will to be what God wants it to be. And so to kind of summarize chapters 1 and 2, we then turn our attention to chapter 3. Gentiles are under sin, chapter 1, and need the gospel. Jews are under sin, chapter 2, and need the gospel. Chapter 3 summarizes that idea. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and need the gospel. I want you to look in these passages that clearly teach us the universal problem of sin and therefore the need of the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. The Word of God records this. What then? Are we better than they? Are we Jews better than anybody else? No, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Then if you would, look down to the summary statement about sin in verse number 23. The Word of God says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Friend, I don't want you to miss this point. As we think about this first section in the book of Romans, please understand the overarching initial idea is the gospel is God's power to save and all men everywhere need that gospel. And so the Jews had to come to this conclusion. The Gentiles had to realize it. And friend, it's got to be practical as well. I have to realize I've sinned. You've sinned. All men everywhere have sinned. And just as relevant and pertinent as the message to the first century hearers, whether Jew or Gentile, so is that message for me and you today. Like it or not, we all realize if we're of an accountable age, we understand right and wrong, we have the mental ability to understand right and wrong, we all realize I've sinned. I've fallen short of the glory of God. I've done things that are not right. So have you. Therefore, I desperately need the gospel of Jesus Christ which is God's power to save. Not only do we see the universal nature of sin, but we see the universal need for salvation as found in Jesus Christ. Now, some of these Jews then are going to have some questions, and Paul is going to address those. One of their first questions then is going to be, why did you give us the law, God? What purpose was the old law if everybody's under sin now? And the law did have a purpose. Notice Romans 3, verses 19 and 20. The Bible says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law pointed out sin. Galatians 3 verse 15, it was a tutor or a, a guide pointing one to Christ. Acts 13 verses 38 and 39, it was never intended to be the final answer to the sin problem, but it helped man to better understand what sin was and ultimately to point men and women to Jesus Christ. But again, the good news is illustrated in Romans 3 verse 24, and that is today, Men and women are saved by God's grace and the redemption that's found in Christ. Notice Romans 3. As he concludes this idea about the universal nature of sin, he also points to the universal salvation, and that's in Christ. Romans 3, 24, the Bible says this, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is set in Jesus Christ. And he's made that available to all. He's going to go on to say. So illustrating the beautiful idea why men and women everywhere need Jesus Christ. I know it. You know it. It's a personal need. And Jesus is the answer to the sin problem. Then he moves into chapter 4. And as we think about chapter 4, he's going to illustrate 
the power of faith and, and, and faith in Jesus Christ and why that is so important that goes all the way back to the promise of faith made to the great patriarch Abraham. I want you to notice Romans chapter 4, verse number 13, and what the writer says about faith and the promise made through faith, not the law. Romans 4, verse 13, the scripture records this. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And so these Jews have got a lot of questions now. God, why did you choose Abraham? What about that, that promise that you made to Abraham? Aren't we the descendants of that? And God will say, hey, that promise was never made through law. It wasn't based on a law system that if I do this and put a check mark beside it, and I do this and put a check mark beside it, and my ancestry dates back to these people, and I've got a check mark beside that, I have met the requirements of the law, therefore I'm a recipient of the promise. God says, no, the promise was never by law. It was made through faith. When God said to Abraham, I want you to get up from your country. I want you to, in essence, pack up your belongings. I want you to load it all up, and I want you to follow me, and I'll go, and you go wherever I tell you when I tell you. Friend, that wasn't based on law. That was based on faith in God. And friend, that same type of trusting, obedient faith in Jesus Christ, who is the seed promise of Abraham, is what saves men and women today. Now, there's no doubt that law has always existed, for people, Romans 4 verse 15 clearly teaches that, but the salvation of it, salvation, God's salvation has always been by God's grace combined with man's faith or obedient trust. Notice Romans chapter 4 verses 15 and 16. The scripture records this, For if those who are of the law are heirs, heirs by the law alone, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, and not only those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He goes on to clearly emphasize these ideas. It's not by law. It's not because you've kept the law or you are part of the law or you're part of this covenant or, or this uh, descendancy. No, the promise is according to God's grace. By grace are you saved, combined with man's obedient trust through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. And friend, that's a big part of what the Jewish people missed. They had the idea of, of law keeping, even though they couldn't keep it perfectly themselves. Acts 15 verses 1 through 8 clearly teaches they had this idea of law keeping. And yet it was never on a system of law keeping. It was always by God's grace, combined with man's ability to trust, take God at His word, and obey Him. And friend, those same ideas are so clear and so true today as well. This is why Abraham... When you think about Abraham, the Jews have this idea that you know, Abraham's going to save the nation of Israel. Abraham is a Hebrew. He's the father of the Hebrew nation. And any Hebrew who's the descendant of Abraham is going to be saved. Wait a minute now. That's not what the Bible said. Abraham was going to save not just the Hebrew nation, all nations in his seed. That's the big point that the Jews missed. Oh, Abraham's going to save the Hebrew. No. Abraham's going to save all nations. How do we know that? Through his seed, who is Christ. Look in your Bible in Romans chapter 4. I want you to see this real important point that the Jews missed. Romans 4, look in verses 17 and 18. As it is written, God says, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believe God, who gives to life, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he, watch this now, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. When God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, I'll bless you and your seed now bless all, and when he talks about Abraham as the father, it's not, the, it's not of the Hebrew nation alone. He's the father of many nations. How is that? Because through Abraham, 
Galatians 3 verse 15 following teaches, His seed was actually Christ. And when Jesus gave the Great Commission, what did He say? Go into all the world. When Jesus made the, the great promise, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. At the close of the book of Revelation, let whosoever will, not Jews alone, not Gentile alone, not a certain group. Friend, there's a universal need for the gospel because of sin. That's Romans 1 through 3. And through faith in Jesus Christ, anybody, anywhere can access the grace of God and be saved. Now, friend, isn't that wonderful news? Isn't it good to know? It doesn't matter uh, what nation you're of. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what color your hair or your eyes or, or if you're a man or a woman or, or if you've got a lot of money in your bank account or you don't have any. If you've got a lot of friends or you don't have any. None of that. Socioeconomical things are, are, are of the nation. That's not what's important today. What's important? The gospel is God's power to save both Jews and Greek. Anybody who will believe in Jesus Christ can be saved if they obey the gospel. Now, friend, let's come full circle as we bring our lesson to a close today. And let's remember again the personal need for that. I need that message. You need that message. Because, friend, whether we want to deal with it or not, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Someone once said, if all have sinned, I have sinned. I have sinned, and I've fallen short of the glory of God, and so have you. And the only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ. Have you heard the message about Christ? Romans 10, verse 17. Do you really believe He is the Savior of the world? Matthew 1, 19 through 21. Would you turn from sin in repentance? and turn to God, Luke 13, verse 3. Would you confess His name and be baptized in water? Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. And then would you, you do your best every day to be faithful unto death? Revelation 2, verse 10. The gospel's God's power to save. Our question to you today is, have you accessed that gospel? If not, we encourage you to do so now while we have time and while we have opportunity. May God help each of us to put our trust in Him. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.